Good evening. I'm Ian Wardropper, director of the Frick Collection. I'm delighted to welcome you all tonight. Uh, the exhibition, Enlightenment and Beauty, Sculptures by Udon and Clodion, just opened yesterday, organized by Denise Allen and Katie Steiner of our curatorial department and intern Elise Muller. The show brings together marble and terracotta works by two of the greatest, one might just as well say the greatest, French 18th century sculptors who were both students in Rome in the 1760s and went on to highly successful careers in Paris. Between the Frick and New York private collections, there are exceptional, exceptional works of, by them available nearby, but not always accessible. So we're pleased to bring them together in this show. By displacing works that we see here daily in the collection to a different location, we ourselves have learned quite a lot from this new perspective. The loans from private collections are masterpieces in their own right, but in context with other works by the artists, they teach us more about them. Finally, this is the first time that we've shown sculpture in the Portico Gallery, and the abundant natural light illuminates the works brilliantly and variously at different times of day. So I urge you to go back to the show um, at, at twilight or in the morning, um, because that's really truly the way to see sculpture, is, is accumulation of views over time through different lights. Because not all the lenders, understandably, could lend us the pieces for the entire run of a year, which is how long the show will be up, we will rotate pieces in and out uh, over this time, uh, and this will refresh in the exhibition periodically. I'm grateful to all the lenders to the exhibition, uh, as well as to Margot and Jerry Bogert uh, and Mrs. Henry Clay Frick II for funding this exhibition. When Denise Allen and I were considering who would be the ideal lecturer for this exhibition, we did not have to think long or look far. Anne Poulet, Director Emerita of the Frick Collection, is one of the foremost authorities in the world on both Houdon and Clodion. She was co-author of the catalog Clodion, 1738-1814, published in conjunction with the exhibition at the Louvre in 1992. This was a milestone in scholarship on the artist and remains a touchstone for understanding his artistry and for questions of attribution within his oeuvre. Anne was also an author as well as curator of the exhibition Jean-Antoine Houdon, Sculptor of the Enlightenment, which was seen at the National Gallery of Art in Washington uh, and at the Musée de Versailles in 2003-2004. This too was a major contribution to scholarship of this artist, immediately becoming an essential reference book. Many of you know that after receiving a master's degree at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University, Anne went on to become a curator and eventually the head of the European Decorative Arts and Sculpture Department at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts from 1978 to 1999. She was director of the Frick from 2003 until I had the good fortune to succeed her in 2011. Anne's achievements have long been acknowledged by a number of awards uh, and I'll just cite the Iris Foundation Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Decorative Arts, which was conferred in 2000, and as Chevalier de l'Ordre des, des Arts des Lettres by the French Minister of Culture in 2007. I'm very happy to be able to welcome Anne back tonight. Thank you, Ian, for that very gracious and generous introduction. And my congratulations on the beautiful exhibition of focusing on the works of Houdon and Clodion in the Portico Gallery. Before I begin, I do want to express my gratitude to um, Ian, to uh, Denise Allen, Katie Steiner, Adrian Lee, Joe Godlow, Julia Day, all of whom were of enormous help bo both in the preparation of, of the exhibition photo and photographs and do you mind I'm just going to lower this slightly just, just sort of taping just to be sure am i hears you. oh okay they have been wonderful uh colleagues and helped me with the um, hurdles of technology which i always find difficult Tonight, uh, I would like to focus on these artists, Clodion and Udon, and their rela relationship to the world of Greco-Roman art in the second half of the 18th century. 
Both sculptors have been called neoclassical and neo-baroque. Clodion has also been labeled a Rococo artist. So I thought we might look and see what the real relationship was, as far as we can determine it, uh, was between these artists and the Greco-Roman past. The two were virtual contemporaries, and their careers followed similar trajectories. Claude Michel, called Clodion, was born in Nancy in the east of France in 1738, and Udon was born in Versailles three years later in 1741. Both artists came to Paris to study at the French Royal Academy of Sculpture and Painting, Painting and Sculpture. Um, Clodion first trained in the studio of, of his famous uncle, Lambert Sigisbert Adin, in the late 1750s. It was there that he had his initial exposure to Greco-Roman antiquities. His uncle had helped form an important collection of these works for the uh, Cardinal de Polignac in Rome. He had restored many of them and published them in a booklet, the cover of which you see here. Through his uncle, Clodion was also introduced to the style of Bernini and the Italian Baroque. A powerful influence on uh, his uncle's Adam, Adam's, Lambert Sigibert's Adam's work. Here's an example of his Neptune, which I think you can see owes a big debt to, to Bernini. And this influence would continue to inform Clodion's own style, as we'll see. While Uno did not come from a dynasty of sculptors, he did, did have the good fortune to move to Paris with his family as a child of eight, where his father served as the custodian or concierge of the prestigious École des élèves protégés, a school created to prepare the winners of the Prix de Rome from the Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture for their three-year stay at the French Academy in Rome. The students studied ancient history, literature, works of art, and biblical history. It is said that Udon was precocious as a sculptor and encouraged by the students in his early endeavors while he was still a teenager. Clodion won the Prix de Rome in 1759, and Udon won it two years later. They both were steeped in the study of Greek Roman sculpture at the French Academy. As you can see in this watercolor by Charles Natoire of 1746, this um, is Natoire teaching. You can see students um, drawing after live models who have assumed classical poses. And then there are plaster casts. This is the Farnese Hercules, Medici Venus, uh, and so forth. Natoire was to be named director of the French Academy in Rome in 1751 and served during the stays of both Clodion and Udon and was their perpetual uh, supporter. Both of our sculptors attended the École des élèves protégés in Paris for three years. In late December of 1762, Clodion arrived finally at the Palazzo Mancini on the Corso in Rome. Sorry. <clears throat> this is a Piranesi view of the, of the Palazzo, which it then housed the French Academy, and Udon arrived there two years later in 1764. This was a time of enormous excitement about recent and ongoing excavations in Herculaneum, Pompeii, Hadrian's Villa, and a number of other sites. Rome was the most important stop on the Grand Tour for collectors and amateurs from England, France, Germany, Russia, Sweden, and beyond. And the French Academy was a regular part of the itinerary for these visitors who toured the studios of the artists who were in residence there. Udon and Clodion had already known each other in Paris. And in Rome, their studios were adjacent on the same floor of the Palazzo Mancini. 
Under Natoire's direction, the students studied collections of antiquities, the Capitol Line Museum being an especially popular venue. In another watercolor by Natoire, we see a student drawing in the Capitol Line collection. Here. Right here. <clears throat> What is of significance concerning both Clodion and Udon is that they had the permission of the director to do their sketching in clay. In fact, to my knowledge, not a single drawing has ever been convincingly attributed to either sculptor. This engraving shows a group of young artists capital, uh, uh, copying after the antique in the Capitoline Museum. And in the rear center, we see a student modeling in clay after the dying gladiator. So we actually have an example here of a student who is not drawing like the others, but actually uh, modeling. <clears throat> Clodion soon made a specialty of small, highly finished terracotta reliefs and statuettes inspired by Greco-Roman Greco models. And according to his biographer, he developed an international clientele of collectors who bought them as soon as they were completed. For example, this terracotta figure of Minerva was inspired by the over-sized Roman marble after a Greek original of Minerva that you see on the right, which is from the Giustiani collection in the Vatican. The small scale, beautiful modeling and warm color of Clodion's statuette infuse it with a distinctly 18th century charm. It is not a dull, slavish imitation of the antique, but rather a lively and skillful interpretation. In the Frick exhibition are two reliefs. <clears throat> Come to that in a second. Uh, by Clodion, both executed during his time in Rome and both based on a wall painting that had been excavated at Herculaneum in the, in the late 1750s. Here's an image of, of that painting. It is unlikely that Clodion saw the actual wall painting. And here you have the, the terracotta and the marble uh, versions of the relief by Clodion. However, the uh, painting was engraved and published in 1762 in a folio volume entitled Le Antiquita d'Ercolano. We know that Clodion owned this volume because it was listed in the inventory of his belongings after his death. The subject, called La Marchande d'Amour, or The Selling of Cupids, is an erotic one that appealed to the taste for the amorous and titillating as well as for the antique. In the painting, we see a seated older woman who is offering different Cupid. <clears throat> Stick with the engraving, sorry. Uh, who is offering different Cupids or loves to a young woman seated in front of her, who's accompanied by a, a maiden. The size and pleasure she can expect is indicated by the gesture of the Cupid's hand and arm. In Noli's engraving of the subject, the scene is made more angular and streamlined, and the erotic gesture has been uh, uh, eliminated or modified. Here, let you see. <clears throat> Clodion's reliefs, doubtless taken from the engraving, further simplify the scene. Oops, sorry. eliminating the architectural background entirely, as well as the swag of cloth. In looking carefully at the terracotta version, we can see that the sculptor draws in the clay, the graceful outlines of the figures, and maintains a fine, delicate, low relief for both sculptures, one that makes us think of the style of 15th century Florentine artists such as Donatello or Desiderio. <clears throat> The subject of the selling of cupids was also treated by the French neoclassical um, painter Joseph-Marie Vien 
in a picture he exhibited in Paris at the Salon of 1763. While he <clears throat> also relied on the Noli engraving, Vien has prettified the subject and created a domestic boudoir by adding fluted pilasters in the background, a pedestal with a vase on it, a cloth-covered table on which sits a vase and a steaming incense burner, a jewelry casket. He has also reintroduced the erotic gesture of the Cupid. We find that Clodion often took themes that he had first treated in the 1760s in Rome and reused them in different formats later in his career. For instance, this a uh, clock model dated 1802, and probably by a sculptor in Clodion's entourage, returns to the subject of the selling of cupids. This time, the seller's holding the cupids in a large sack, as you see down here, and then displaying them one at a time for review. Udon also modeled small terracottas after the antique, as in this statuette of a vestal. <coughs> now on view in the Portico Gallery. Based on a life-size marble in the Capitoline Museum, Udon emphasizes the fine pleats of the robe and the heavier texture of the overgarment or shawl. Vestals were chaste priestesses who guarded the fire on the altar of Vesta, the Roman goddess of the hearth, and were punished by being buried alive if they lost their chastity or allowed the fire to go out. This subject enjoyed great popularity in the 1760s and 70s. With direct ties to Greco-Roman sculpture and painting, it offered a classical subject of moral rectitude in the form of a young, alluring woman. In 1787, Udon was to reinterpret the subject in this magnificent life-size marble of a veiled vestal recently acquired by the Louvre. While in Rome, Clodion also modeled a small statuette of a vestal on the left <clears throat> that he later executed in a larger marble version, now in the National Gallery in Washington, right here, <clears throat> for Catherine II of Russia. For the most part, these sculptures were intended for and acquired by private aristocratic collectors and connoisseurs. Ironically, even though both Udon and Clodion owed their training to the French Royal Academies in Paris and Rome, they produced very few works for the French crown. Clodion stayed in Rome for nine years, far exceeding the three allotted at the Academy for the winners of the Prix de Rome. And his sculpture evolved in a distinctly different, uh, different and decorative direction. This terracotta statuette of the three graces, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> for example, dates from his Italian years. I would like to suggest that Clodion, and, and this I, um, is a slide I wanted to add to show you that we can be fairly certain that it was a, a fountain model because this, this is a photograph that was taken from a, an early 20th century sale catalog. It's the same group, but since then it has been separated from its um, base, classical column, and a swag. And there is a green marble basin um, on, the, on the top, both of which ha have since disappeared. I would like to suggest that Clodion took his inspiration in part from Germain Pilon's 16th century group of the Three Graces, a cast of which was in the cast, the cast court at the Louvre, but more importantly, from a terracotta based on an ant antique Hecat sculpture by Bartolomeo Cav Cavaceppi. Cavaceppi was an enormously successful and influential sculptor who had a large studio in Rome. This is his, Cavaceppi's uh, terracotta. Here is his Rome, Rome studio. He restored antiques, sold them, copied them. 
and created his own neoclassical works in clay and marble. Cavaccetti's studio was certainly known to the students at the French Academy, just as was that of Piranesi, who also dealt in antiquities. Piranesi's studio, in fact, was uh, located directly across the Corso from the French Academy's Palazzo Mancini. Clodion was to take the theme of three supporting female figures and reinterpret it in a variety of ways. This drawing by Saint Aubin illustrates a similar fountain model by Cl Clodion, now lost, uh, which was shown at the Salon of 1799, in which the figures hold their breasts, and one assumes that, that water was meant to, to spout from them into a basin. The superb clock in the Portico Gallery exhibition, the terracotta base of which is signed and dated Clodion 1788, further develops the theme of three supporting female figures. As with the fountain model, the figures are in three states of undress, perhaps alluding to the times of day or the hours. However, they are animated, seemingly dancing in a circle around a fluted column while turning the horizontal dial of the globe of the clock in their upheld hands. The concept of dancing figures marking the passage of time is a familiar one that was also represented by Poussin in his great painting, uh, The Dance of Time in the Wallace Collection. The Frick clock was in the collection of Alexandre Théodore Brognard, a prominent architect with whom Clodion collaborated in the design and decoration of houses in Paris. For the dining room of the hotel, Botrel Quintin, which you see here, <coughs> Clodion created four life-size plaster groups of dancing female figures wearing finely pleated uh, classical robes and bearing platters of fruit each placed in a corner niche of the room. These, these were the niches originally intended uh, for the groups. As you can see here, the sculptor is using a variation of the same supporting group for the plasters as that found on the Frick's clock. After his return to Paris in 1771, Clodion's beautifully modeled terracotta sculptures that were so appreciated by aristocratic collectors and amateurs became more animated and more complex in composition, often involving multiple figures and lifting groups. His subjects were often drawn from the myth mythological world of Ovid rather than Roman history. Following the French Revolution, perhaps in an effort to reclaim his lost clientele among the émigrés who were returning to Paris, he produced a remarkable series of these groups. Among them is this sculpture representing Zephyrus and Flora, dated 1799. While there is an echo of Clodion's study of the Capitoline Greco-Roman marble of Cupid and Psyche that you see on the right, especially in the interlocking embrace of the nude lovers, Zephyrus and Flora seem to float, spiraling upward. The figures are on, on tiptoe. The finely pleated piece of drapery billows. And there's very little drapery, but it's, it's oops, sorry. <laughs> it's telling um, right here. <clears throat> And the figures are borne upward by whipped cream clouds and winged putti. The composition owes as much to Bernini's illusionistic sculptures, such as the Apollo and Daphne, as it does to any antique precedent. However, Clodion has made this sculpture, which is a technical masterpiece, entirely his own. Now I would like to return to Udon, whose stay in Rome paralleled that of Clodion but lasted only four years, from 1764 to 1768. Exposed to the same public and private collections of antique and Baroque art, and working under the same director of the academy, Charles Natoir, Udon's Roman experience was, nevertheless, very different from that of his fellow students. 
the German artist Johann Christian von Mannlich, who was a visiting pensionnaire at the French Academy, wrote in his memoirs, quote, at dawn, my neighbor and friend Udon came to get me to go to Saint Louis des Francais, where Monsieur Seguier, professor of surgery, gave us a lesson in anatomy on cadavers for which the king paid. We were the only people from the academy to follow this course and we profited all the more for it. At the time, Udon was modeling a life-size écorché or flayed figure in clay that you see on the screen as a, pre a preparatory study for a statue of St. John the Baptist. for which he had received a commission for the Church of Santa Maria de Angeli in Rome. Manlich writes that the flayed figure was so admired by everyone at the academy that Udon was encouraged to cast the figure in plaster. So, sorry. Um, well, it doesn't matter. The, and this Fa uh, the, fo uh, the figure you see on the left is the first plaster cast uh, made by the sculptor and given to the French Academy in Rome in 1767 as an anatomical model for the students, and it's still there. At the same time, Udon was steeped in the study of collections of antiquities that were available to him in Rome and Paris. For example, to give his figure of John the Baptist the authority and gravitas required, he must have referred to such Roman statues as this marble standing figure of Augustus Prima Porta that you see on the right, where the carriage of the body and it, its extended right arm, although the hand of John the Baptist, of course, is palm down in a gesture of blessing. This blend of the direct study of the bones, muscles, tendons, and skin of actual bodies, combined with a thorough knowledge of Greco-Roman and later Renaissance and Baroque sculptures, informed Udon's entire oeuvre and predisposed him to become a great portraitist. It also led to controversy about some of his most important works. One of Udon's iconic figures is that of Diana the Huntress, a terracotta version of which, life-size, over-life-size version of which is in the Frick collection. Although intended for exhibition in the Paris Salon of 1777, this is the plaster, uh, it was shown instead in the sculptor's studio because it was thought to be prurient a departure from traditional classical prototypes in which the goddess wears a tunic and sandals, as in the Roman marble group after a Greek original housed in the Louvre, Udon deliberately chose to depict the chaste goddess entirely nude, with only a crescent moon in her hair, a bow in her left hand, and an arrow in her right. Her lithe body is of ideal proportions, as she runs balanced on the ball of one foot. And her anatomical details, including the genitalia, are clearly defined. The figure stirred up considerable controversy and was criticized for its nudity by the Duc d'Angevillers, who was the surintendant des bâtiments du roi, or the manager of the king's works. But it was praised by figures from the Enlightenment circle, such as Melchior Grimm, who may, in fact, have played a role in choosing the nude format for the figure. Udon sold a plaster version to the Duke of Saxe-Gotha in Germany, and then a marble version. Sorry, what you see on the right? <clears throat> to the Empress Catherine II of Russia, now in the Gulbenkian uh, collection. In the marble, as you can see, the sculptor was obliged to add reeds to support the weight of, of the uh, stone. Oops, sorry. I said I was technically challenged. There we go. Um, so you see he's, ha he's had to add these reeds to support the figure and then also um, added a drapery here to, or, no, it's, it's a um, quiver to support the weight of the arm. And 
I think it makes it a heavier and less successful composition, and one appreciates the purity of the terracotta and uh, plaster versions when one, one sees this comparison. In 1790, Udon cast two life-size bronzes for a wealthy banker in Paris, one of Diana and one of Apollo. As with the Diana, Apollo is running forward, balanced on the ball of one foot, with his hair blowing behind him. And he is shown entirely nude, with only his lyre as an attribute. Udon has looked to the Apollo Belvedere as a classical model, but has introduced a freer, lighter movement in his bronze. The beauty of the natural body is foremost. Udon is often called the greatest portrait sculptor of the 18th century in Europe or of all time. What made his portraits so gripping and memorable? Some documents and indicate that he executed a few portrait medallions of his friends while in Rome, but none is known to have survived. His first portrait bust is probably the terracotta of Denis Diderot, the philosopher, critic, and co-author of the famous Encyclopédie on the left, which, which was shown at the Salon of 1771, and which um, is considered, it was considered by Diderot himself to be an excellent uh, likeness, but it really launched Udon's reputation, for he has chosen to show the philosopher with a uh, nude truncation uh, to the neck, natural hair, and the details of, of every um, nuance of his face, eyes, and partially opened lips. He, of course, was looking at the prototype of Roman uh, portraiture, such as, as the bust you see uh, on, the, on the right. However, where that bust has plain, uncarved eyes, Udon has uh, done what he was to be his typical treatment of the eyes in that he uh, scooped out um, a, a shallow rim to show the iris and then a deeper uh, bowl in the middle for the pupil keeping a small piece of terracotta attached to the eyelid, which when a raking light comes across the, the sculpture, makes the eyes look uh, lively and, um, and moist. The image captures not only the physical appearance of the man, but also his character. It was Udall's ambition to execute portrait busts of all of the most gifted and influential fig figures of his time, persons of merit, not of birth. And they, in turn, chose him to memorialize them. The iconic pictures that we think of, think of uh, and which are on view, this is a, a view of Udall's studi studio painted in about 18.3 by Boyi. And first of all, we see him modeling directly from life, as he always preferred to do. But then the shelves are lined with examples of his portraiture uh, and many of the greatest figures of our time, and their images have been canonized by uh, the busts made by Udon. Here we see George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and then uh, lower down his great icon iconic large um, sculpt sculptures of Voltaire, Diderot, and so forth. I should say that this was also a business. And one of the reasons that Udon was so resented by the um, royal manager of the king's works was because he had a business and an income that was independent from the king. He, all of these works were for sale. He kept the molds for each one. And if you wanted uh, a Diderot in bronze, the price was such and such. If you wanted a plaster, it was less, terracotta less, marble more. 
Um, and so he ran a business. For example, he sold his écorché uh, to uh, art schools all over Europe and gained a financial independence and a creative independence that was very much resented um, by the crown. One of the d dilemmas for the sculptor and the sitter was uh, what to wear. For example, in 1778, Oudon was commissioned by a Masonic lodge in Paris to portray Voltaire, who had just returned after 20 years in exile. As with Diderot, he represented Voltaire nude, virtually bald, with a brief classical cut to the bust. For other patrons, he portrayed the philosopher in contemporary dress and wearing a wig as on the right. And for Catherine II of Russia, who revered Voltaire, Oudon showed the full emaciated figure of the old man wearing a classical toga, seated and bent over in a chair, but with an expression full of life and wit. When possible, Oudon liked to make a life mask of his sitters to use as a reference. For his portrait of George Washington, he traveled to Mount Vernon in 1785 to take a, laugh, a life mask and to make a model, uh, a bust in clay while he was there. And this bust is still, still in uh, Mount Vernon. This is the Morgan. <clears throat> he then took them back, along with measurements of Washington's body, uh, to Paris, where he created the full-length marble statue, which was not shipped from Paris until 1792. Here you see it, Virginia Capital. <clears throat> the Frick has in its collection a superb half-length marble portrait of the Marquis Armand Thomas Huet de Miromenil, commissioned shortly after the sitter had been appointed Garde des Sceaux de France, which is roughly the equivalent of Attorney General here uh, by Louis XVI. Although Houdin lavishes extraordinary technical skill in rendering the textures of his spongy wig and elaborate robes of office, what stays with us is the mobile, wily look on Miromenil's intelligent face and his pride in his new office. Surely, Udon was thinking of, and perhaps competing with, the 17th century portraits of Bernini, such as this half-length bust of Cardinal Scipione uh, Borghese, when he was doing his Miromenio. The carving of the textures and folds of the surplice, the irregular positions of the buttons, and the lively, mobile expression of the face all seem to be in the back of Oudon's mind for the Marquis's portrait. The vivacity of these busts belie the hard monochromatic material from which they are made. Despite the timeless record they off offer of these men's physical appearance, they have a compelling immediacy. For Oudon's female portraits, many of the same ob observations hold true, although it is less likely that life masks were taken because it was a fairly painful and unpleasant process. The Frick's lyrical portrait of the Comtesse de Kela is given a classical Roman format in which the sitter wears a thin chiton classical dress buttoned at the shoulders and her and she is portrayed as a running bacchante see how her arms are out and if you look at the bust as it's on view in, in the portico you'll see that her, her hair flies out in in the back so we have the impression that she's moving um, through the position of her head arms and and um, and the hair the spray of grape leaves is an allusion to her being a follower of, of Bacchus and also may have something to do with her family's coat of arms because their name was Bacchi. Her hair, which is strewn with flowers and loosely drawn up at the crown, flies out behind her. So this, she's an animated, animated figure just as the Diana and the Apollo uh, 
people were, as we saw earlier. Also dating from the 1770s, this large marble bust representing Madame Is, married to a German banker and a personal friend of Udon and his wife, uh, entered the collection just a few years ago as a very generous gift. Carved from a single piece of marble, this is a grand and expensive port portrait on which Udon has lavished great attention. The base is part of the block of marble. Udon has created a heavy cloth to wrap around the truncation of the arms and the base. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, sorry. Here we see the. In order to make a graceful transition, a technique that was often used by other uh, 17th and 18th century portrait sculptures in France. The sitter is shown wearing a thin, low-cut gown trimmed with a band at the edge and held by a diagonal strap that crosses between her breasts, perhaps alluding to the strap meant to hold the quiver for Diana the Huntress, a vaguely allegorical neoclassical costume. Here you see the back of the bust that it is a, one entire piece of marble and then this wonderful hair which falls down um, over her shoulders and, and her back. A similar costume and pose are present on Paju's bust of Madame Al, also in the Frick collection. In the de delicate modeling of the face of Madame Is, one senses her age of 42. Her eyes, carved in Udon's customary way, express her intelligence and reserve. Udon not only liked to work from the live model, but he was also skilled in portraying death. And one of his most moving and appealing reliefs is the one of a dead thrush that you see on the left, uh, executed in 1782 and in the exhibition. In it, he again is trying to defy the hard texture of marble to create the impression of soft down feathers and the weight of the organs of this little body which are um, falling with gravity, and then the stiff, um, lifeless wings. And as a kind of trompe l'oeil, uh, Udon ha has carved the wings so that it goes out beyond the boundary of the marble plaque of which it is a part. He's certainly challenging uh, in this, his trompe l'oeil all in one monochromatic medium. Those done by other 18th century French artists such as, such as Udry, whom you see, whose work you see on the right, uh, and of a, of a dead duck. Udry is playing with different tones of white, but it's the paragone between painting and sculpture, each one trying to create an illusion um, that uh, is not available uh, to the other. Udon did several versions of uh, uh, these dead birds, sometimes two birds. There's another marble with one bird. And they were, an example was sent to the court of Saxe Gotha to teach students how to carve texture in marble. If we look at this second painting of Udon in his studio by Boyi, also of about 1803, when Udon was 62, we see a kind of manifesto of his lifelong interests, technique, and work. In the center, the sculptor wearing working clothes, nothing fancy, just a, a work, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, and he is modeling clay in front of a live model. 
You can see a bowl of water under the stand that he uses to keep the clay moist between sittings. Behind him, students are drawing after the same model. And just to the right of the sitter is a plaster cast of a torso of a Greco-Roman Venus. And hanging on the wall above is a plaster cast of a bearded Roman head. One sees here that the first priority from, for Udon is the live model, with casts always at hand for inspiration and reference. Portraits became his specialty and his great contribution to the history of sculpture and of art because he was able to capture in his images of individuals, particularly those uh, of great accomplished figures of the Enlightenment, mostly men, uh, was able not only to capture the individual features of their faces and their bodies, but also their spirit. This was something that was appreciated at the time by all of the um, artists and the audience and appreciated again by us today. Both Udon and Clodion then were profoundly neoclassical, but from the outset of their careers, they were not dryly imitating monuments of the past, but rather absorbing antique mo models in terms of their own artistic vision to create profoundly original works of art of enduring beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Anne, for that wonderful lecture that somehow managed to include almost all the works of the exhibition in a seamless uh, explication of the importance of these two artists. Um, we have a little time, and if you'd like to ask questions, Anne would be happy to answer. Are there any questions? Yes, also. I'm sorry? That's a very good question. Uh, in the case of, a part of it was, a, a, in the case of both Clodion and Udon, they always first modeled in clay. And a plaster cast was made after the clay model. And then in some cases, a marble was executed. Um, they were both very skilled in both media, but there, there, was, there was a um, cost to marble, particularly for large uh, pieces. And for example, virtually all of the sculptures that went to the court of Saxe Gotha, and it's the biggest collection outside of the Louvre, uh, were plaster. And economics uh, was a factor. Uh, some of them were tinted terracotta color, some of them were uh, tinted a bronze color, and then others were, were white. Alas, most of them have been painted since and um, lost their original surfaces. So the, um, and certainly I would say that Clodion was primarily um, a modeler, although you saw with the Vestal, with the relief of the selling of cupids, he was capable of extraordinarily fine work uh, in marble as well. Udon was equally skilled in both, and he must have had assistance in his studio, but as you noticed in both of those paintings by Boyi, you don't see any assistance, whereas in Cavaceppi's studio, you see them all, all over the place. So he must have had people who were blocking out marbles um, uh, for him because his output was so extraordinary, but I think he, he finished them all himself and was as comfortable in carving as he was in, in modeling. And he also prided himself on being able, having his own bron bronze foundry and being able to cast his own bronzes. And the Apollo that I showed you that was made as a, a pendant to the Diana was cast by 
Udon in his own bronze foundry, and he sent out invitations to people to come and see him do it because he had disdain for other sculptors who would turn their models over to a bronzier. Um, so he, he, I would say it was at ease in, in uh, particularly in terracotta and, and in uh, marble. Anybody else? Yes. That's a great question. Um, depending on the size, the, uh, in, in order to um, bear, the, bear the weight, there would be some sort of structure inside the clay. Uh, and for large figures, for example, the Diana, the, the figure uh, was made in, in pieces and assembled. First, there was a small figure that was, was solid. A cast was made of that, a plaster created, and then that was blown up to a larger size. And the terracotta of the Frick, for example, um, I don't know how many pieces it's in. Do you, Joe? Or Julio? Um, but he sent instructions, uh, for example, for the plaster, Diana, that went to Gotha on how to put it together and how long to let the um, plaster between the joints dry and how to clean them off. Uh, so those were done in pieces, as were the bronzes. Um, and then smaller figures could be uh, cast in, in one piece. Does that answer your question? But it's, and, and they're technical masterpieces. When you think of the weight of uh, the Frick's life-size terracotta Diana, is, it's balanced on the ball of one foot. And so to get that to stand up and to stay is an engineering challenge as much as it is an artistic one. Anybody else? Yes? Sorry, I'm kind of blinded by the light, so. Great question. Uh, when Udon came back from um, Italy, he was given a studio, a very large studio, the one you see in the boy painting. Oh, I should make that go away. Um, in, in the, what is now the Bibliothèque Nationale. And uh, as you can see, it was a, a, a grand, space. And he would do versions, for example, of, of his écorché. You could have it this big, you could have it life size, you could have it with the arm up, you could have it with the arm out, and so forth. He kept all of the molds in, in the gallery. And he became very upset because um, fakes were being sold on the marketplace as his originals. And he resented losing the income. There's actually a, um, a police report about this. And Udon, to my knowledge, was the first sculptor in the uh, French 18th century to create red wax seals, which, and, and he wrote, if you want to buy my écorché, you have to come to my studio at the Bibliothèque Nationale. And it, it's by me if it has my red wax stamp on it. And that was his way of separating uh, the fakes from the, from the genuine um, pieces. Part of it was because he felt he was losing money. Part of it was pride because of the um, way he finished his plasters. And he, and he was um, extremely vain about that and didn't want knockoffs uh, being circulated under, under his name. If you see uh, paintings not only by Boyi but other artists, in the second half of the 18th century, you sometimes will see in pictures of studios uh, a plaster of the écorché in a smaller size, larger size. Um, and it was a real business for him. But that, that was his, his uh, guarantee of authenticity. And it wasn't 
uh, for terracottas. It was, it was uh, for plasters. And of course, in the 19th, 20th, 21st centuries, <laughs> people in the art market um, know that. <laughs> so there are red wax seals that, that appear um, sometimes on works of art. It's, it says uh, Udon sculpts it and, and, and that he is a, a student of the Royal Academy of uh, sculpture and painting. Well, you find sometimes these red wax stamps on things that were done under Napoleon. And the Royal Academy ended uh, with the French Revolution. So it's not the guarantee today that it may have been when, um, when Udon invented the, the idea. Anyone else? Yes. Oh, hi, Jay. Oh, wonderful question. Uh, Benjamin Franklin went to Paris as a, he had been in England and then he went to Paris as a diplomat. I think it was in 1774 or five, maybe wrong about that. Uh, and he, he went to negotiate um, advantageous commercial treaties and to try to, to strengthen the, the relationship between France and the United States. And then he came back um, again as an American envoy. He was the plenipotentiary, I can never remember the full title. Um, and after the revolution was won, he was the first American ambassador named to France for the new United States, that was in, in 83. He knew everybody. And uh, Udon did his portrait almost right away. Some people think it was on speculation because he wanted to have this gallery of great figures. And Franklin was so famous, not only because of his diplomatic skills, but also uh, because of his um, invention or discovery of electricity. So Franklin got to know Udon. Then Jefferson came to France in 1785. Jefferson was very interested in the arts and he and Franklin were very close. They went to see Udon. And when the state of Virginia wanted to commission, first it was going to be a, um, an equestrian statue of Washington they wrote to Jefferson and Franklin and said, who can we get, you know, what do you suggest? And there's a wonderful letter from Jefferson who uh, writes back to say, my understanding is that the greatest sculpture, sculptor in, in um, the world is a man named Udon. So the commission was arranged through Franklin and Jefferson for the um, Washington to be done. Washington never went to Europe. And so uh, the legislature said, well, we'll send you a Charles Wilson Peel full length portrait of Washington. And then you can just whip something up on that basis. And Udon, who felt it was the most important commission of his life, refused. And he said, I have to work from, from life. And so he and Benjamin Franklin went together to Virginia. When Franklin was leaving uh, Paris, Jefferson was still there. And this was in 1785, I think. And um, went to Mount Vernon. And that's when the life mask that, that I showed you was taken by Udon and he did that bust which he left. Uh, and there was no one in the United States. You know, there was no a monumental sculpture made here. So it, it was really Udon, I mean, it was, it was really Jefferson and Franklin who made that happen. 
And then they were portrayed, and all the Americans in Paris were, were portrayed, John Paul Jones and, and Governor Morris and so, and so forth. So he became the, not only was he the chosen portrait sculptor for them, but he, uh, Oudin also wanted to portray these great figures uh, of, of American and European history. So that's how it happened. And there's a wonderful discussion. Tell me when you've had enough. Um, <laughs> there's a wonderful discussion by letter about what, uh, what Washington should wear. And Udon wanted him to wear a Roman toga. And uh, he thought that that was appropriate. And Washington said, well, I don't know too much about these things, but I kind of like to wear my own clothes. And so there was a, a back and forth. It was decided in a question, monument was much too expensive, so it was going to be a standing uh, marble statue. And finally, the decision what was made for, uh, Udon, uh, for Washington to wear his military uniform, but Udon suggested a plow at his feet uh, to indicate that he was like the Roman hero Cincinnatus, who had been a war um, uh, leader, a general, but after the war was over, gave up his military career to go back and farm his land. And Washington was praised for having done the same thing. And so that was introduced, that part of Roman history, uh, or allusion to Roman history, uh, was introduced into the statue of Washington, which was otherwise in his regular, um, who was wearing his regular military uniform. So it was a very interesting exchange to see who, who wanted to look like what. Um, and it had as much to do with the artist as it did with the person commissioning the portrait. So um, that's why it's, it's very interesting, the, the variety that one finds, for example, with Voltaire. Um, 